product, a platform that represents a call to action to solve two crises facing our nation, runaway economic inequality, and climate change. We know that climate change is here and it is real, no matter how many times the Trump administration attempts to deny it. We know because science tells us it is, and because every day we see the devastation that it brings with it, from hurricanes to wildfires to floods to rising temperatures. And we know that economic inequality is lived daily by American workers whose wages are not keeping up with the cost of living for health care and other basic necessities. One of the main drivers of that inequality is the attacks that unions have faced over the last several decades. The trend downward in union representation and the bargaining power that provides for workers has corresponded with an increase in income going to the top 10% of earners. Uh, over the last 40 years, CEOs have seen their compensation skyrocket, a little under 1,000%. Uh, over that same period of time, workers, the typical worker, has barely received any wage increase at all. This summer, we put forward an, a platform to tackle these crises head on. It's called Solidarity for Climate Action. And it is the first of a kind plan put forward by unions and environmental organizations. It wasn't always easy to build the consensus that we achieved in this document. Uh, it took eight months. Uh, it took too many meetings and drafts to count. Uh, but we ach did achieve that consensus, and, um, and that's why we're here to talk about it. We are at a moment now when climate change is back in the public consciousness and back on the agenda of leaders in Washington, D.C. and around the country. This is thanks in large part to the tremendous efforts we've seen over the last year from people across the country, particularly young people, calling for bold action, uh, to the Green New Deal, to the many states moving forward toward strong, clean energy commitments. We view solidarity for climate action as an essential piece of this new public dialogue about how we move our nation to a cleaner, fairer, more prosperous future. There are many similarities between Solidarity for Climate Action and the Green New Deal and a few differences, but they both recognize that climate policy can't be divorced from economic policy and that climate justice and economic justice are two sides of the same coin. As leaders uh, and committees in Congress as well as state and local governments start to put pen to paper and offer ambitious ideas on how to meet our climate goals, our platform offers a visionary, pragmatic roadmap that unifies key labor and environmental constituencies and tackles these crises as they should be, as interrelated uh, and, and, and needing to be dealt with in tandem. What that means in our platform is that any plan to combat the climate crisis should put workers front and center and make sure they are central to the development of the policy. Our platform calls for rapid reductions of greenhouse gas emissions based on the latest science and in line with our fair share to put America on a pathway to reducing its emissions to net zero by 2050 and massive immediate investments in clean and renewable technologies and energy efficiency across all sectors, increasing union density across the country through strong support of the right to organize throughout the economy, including in fast-growing tech, clean technology sectors where not enough of the jobs are high-quality union jobs, rebuilding and modernizing America's infrastructure and making our communities more resilient, a national strategy to lead in clean technology innovation and supply chain development, including major investments in domestic manufacturing, ensuring that our workplaces and communities are safe, clean, and free of hazardous chemicals and toxic pollution, making sure that coal economy workers and communities that rely on that economy, as well as areas that have been devastated by deindustrialization, are not left out in the cold as we move to cleaner, cheaper forms of energy, and ensuring that historically disadvantaged people and people in frontline communities that are feeling the impacts of climate change the most are at the front of the line for opportunities. We know that President Trump and many members of Congress got elected by saying they were gonna be there for working people. We also know they haven't been living up to their words. 
Instead, they've been pitting worker against worker and the labor movement against the environmental movement. We are not gonna play their game. We don't have to choose between good jobs and clean air and water. We can and have to have both. So while they are dividing, BGA is uniting and bringing the labor and environmental movements together, two movements that have to be together for any meaningful climate legislation to successfully be developed and passed into law. Solidarity for Climate Action is our commitment to working people. It's the document that all 14 of our partners, eight labor unions, six environmental organizations, put forward to say climate change is real and the solutions to it must lift up all working people. We're in this fight for a better future, and we're not alone. There are champions in communities, state houses, and in Congress who are fighting for the same future that we outline in Solidarity for Climate Action. Today, I'm pleased to introduce a true leader and champion in the halls of Congress. Representative Kathy Castor chairs the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. She recently traveled to the Midwest and held roundtables to talk about the impacts climate change is having there already and the opportunities to build a clean energy economy in America's heartland. We were pleased to join with her and Representative Debbie Dingell in Michigan last month to talk about the opportunities of, of clean energy manufacturing in the region, particularly in the automotive sector. We've seen firsthand her commitment to understanding these opportunities and addressing these issues in ways that are good for working people. Representative Castor has championed energy efficiency, distributed energy and environmental justice to ensure all communities, families, and individuals enjoy the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards. She's an outspoken advocate for hardworking families, students, veterans, and seniors on a variety of issues, and she is a great friend and ally to the Blue Green Alliance. Please join me in welcoming the member from Florida's 14th Congressional District, Representative Kathy Castor. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jason, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and congratulations on your new assignment as Executive Director of the Blue Green Alliance. Uh, I'm honored to kick off this conference uh, as chair of the new House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Uh, we all have a major task ahead, and we're all in this together. Uh, thanks to Speaker Pelosi, who had the vision uh, and understands the, the urgent need for climate action. And thank you to my colleagues in the Democratic Caucus, who are united on the need for bold climate action. And uh, hopefully we will build bipartisan support as we, we move forward crafting the new uh, climate action plan in the Congress. Our committee is crafting that climate action plan and we're scheduled to release it in March, this March of 2020. Uh, the labor movement and the environmental movement are key to getting us to where we need to be and getting the job done. Uh, this, is a, this is an important time to be working on climate policy, isn't it? That's kind of an understatement. Uh, the need for a national climate policy is clear. Everyone knows it. Have you ever sensed uh, that we have public sentiment behind us like we have now? I don't think so. It's on the front pages every day. Uh, thankfully, in the presidential debates, they're devoting a significant amount of time to it. Uh, the front, one of the headlines in my hometown paper this morning was that young people are frightened. Uh, this week in the Congress, we will be, we're holding a hearing with one of the foreign affairs subcommittees with Greta Thunberg and uh, American young climate activists who are demanding action. They know what has to happen. They are rising to the challenge, and we have to rise with them. Uh, so this March, we'll, we will begin the march towards the bold legislation that has to be passed in the Congress. The, the climate crisis is affecting every, every facet of this economy. It cuts across all of the work that the Congress does. Uh, and since Democrats have taken back the House, we've had over 70 hearings related to climate action. 
uh, and clean energy. We also passed H.R. 9, the Climate Action Now Act, that I led. Thank you to all of you who played an important role in getting that across the finish, uh, finish line. Uh, I was grateful to the Blue Green Alliance's support. And that was pretty low hanging fruit, wasn't it? That simply said that uh, we're going to stay in the Paris Climate Agreement. We're so far beyond that now. We have to do so much more. Uh, but it, it shouldn't be lost in everyone that that was the first major piece of climate legislation that has passed the House of Representatives in 10 years. And I guarantee you it will not be the last. Uh, we've also passed bills to boost energy efficiency, to advance climate resilience, and to block a lot of the harm, harmful rollbacks from the Trump administration. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to be positive, to be forward thinking, to address the fears of the generations behind us. Uh, as I've traveled across America as, in my new role, I've listened to people from all walks of life, uh, private sector, scientists, labor leaders, uh, environmental partners, and people are focused on solutions. And that's what we want to develop in our climate action plan. You can call it the Green New Deal. You can, I'm sure we'll have another catchy moniker for it. Uh, but it's got to be serious, and it must be based on science, and it has to be bold, and it has to meet the, uh, the sense of urgency that we all share. But everywhere I go, people want to know what our economy and what the future of work is going to look like. Uh, what is it going to look like as temperatures rise? And as, I mean, I come from the Tampa Bay area, it's darn hot. You know, we set a, an unfortunate record uh, this summer. They, we had three days in a row. It didn't go below 82 degrees at night. At night. And when you add the humidity levels, that means it's feeling like almost 100 degrees at night. Uh, that's not normal. None of this is normal. What did I hear on the radio this morning? The, again, the Washington had the warmest, another record. I mean, these are, we shouldn't get, be numb to these things. We, we should internalize them and just let that feed our passion for getting things done. And I know that a lot of my uh, colleagues in the Congress share this, but we have to keep pushing them. That's why I love these youth climate activists uh, pushing us, because the Congress definitely needs to be pushed. Uh, but I'm excited to see, talk about pushing us, I'm thrilled to see the plan, the Solidarity uh, for Climate Action Platform, because it lays out a lot of what we need to build into our climate action plan. It ensures that the jobs in the clean energy economy are high quality, family sustaining jobs. Uh, so let's talk about that. First, America should lead the world when it comes to the clean energy economy in technology and in innovation, uh, from how we make batteries to uh, how we remove carbon from the air. We need this technology, but the world needs this technology. And when you look at the challenges ahead, it's going to be passing that technology, the good old American know-how and innovation, passing that on to the developing world so that carbon pollution just doesn't become uh, something that's a runaway train, that we are the leaders in developing that technology. Uh, second, we cannot invest in uh, innovation with our tax dollars here in America and then ship those manufacturing jobs overseas. Uh, we need to build the clean energy economy here uh, where we have some of the best trained and highly skilled workers in the world and they are ready for the challenge. Everyone I talk with, and you all know this, they're ready. Uh, we know we can do this because we already have. The Obama uh, clean car standards are slated to create another 89,000 jobs in advanced ma ma vehicle manufacturing. Uh, that's if we keep them in place. Uh, we know auto workers are already fighting for fair agreements with thousands of UAW uh, members now on strike. As the auto industry continues to change, we need the policies that will help workers uh, their families, their communities thrive. And I heard that message loud and clear. You're right when I uh, spent a few days in Michigan talking with auto workers there. 
Third, we need to make sure that working in the clean energy economy doesn't just become another gig economy that pits workers against other workers. Uh, we need to make sure that workers are able, able to organize, uh, they're able to fight for higher wages, uh, and we need to offer serious education and training in these fields, uh, not just for the new workers coming up, uh, but for the workers whose skills can translate directly into building the wind turbines, the solar panels, uh, and electric vehicles. And of course, we need to make sure that the workers who have kept the lights on for a generation uh, receive the benefits that they're entitled to. Uh, now, ideas are great, plans are great, and legislation is great, but gosh, we need members of Congress who are ready to vote <laughs> for climate action. Uh, we need a Senate that will vote for that legislation, and we need a president who will put uh, his or her signature on that bill, and that means we need to work together to build the political cohesion, the political movement for serious climate action. Climate action now, as great as that was, that's not going to get it done. This has to be a very broad-based, scientifically-based, bold, cr uh, cross-cutting climate action plan. But we know that the forces that want to divide us are very powerful. If I say the name uh, Charles Koch, to a bunch of environmentalists, what do they think? Climate denial. If I say the same name to uh, labor leaders, what do they think? I think union busting. Uh, but if I ask Charles Koch uh, why he spends so much of his money attacking environmentalists and labor unions, what would he say? I know what he thinks. Power, selfishness. The powers of good can defeat the powers of selfishness out there. I'm convinced if we unleash the power of the American people, public sentiment, Speaker Pelosi talks a lot about public sentiment being everything. She references Abraham Lincoln. But that's where we are now, and that's, going to, that's what it's going to take for the bold plan that we need to put in place. We have the people, and that means we have the power, but we have to work together if we're going to win. And that's why we're develop. That's why developing the the Solidarity for Climate Action platform is so important. Uh, grassroots organizers in the labor movement and the environmental movement have working have been working very hard in the face of unprecedented uh, challenges. It's no coincidence that thanks to your hard work, organizing the public is on our side. Uh, we, ha we also have this rising generation of young leaders who understand the stakes. Uh, they're ready to demand action. They're going to be marching in the street. They're already protesting, taking off school on Fridays, as you know. This is going to build. More of them are registering to vote, and they know their power, and they're going to use it. In many ways, we're rediscovering how interconnected the labor movement is with the environmental movement. I think. That's what I see. In the 1960s and 70s, uh, folks understood intuitively that cutting, cutting pollution and fighting for workers were the same battle. Uh, the pollution from factories went right into the frontline communities where workers live, and when our air is dirty, guess who gets affected most? People who work outside. Uh, it's really simple. Look at the Clean Air Act amazing piece of legislation. According to federal scientists, that law will save us $2 trillion in health care costs by the year 2020 alone. That includes 230,000 lives saved. But it also includes wages, 17 million days of work people can do because they're not sick from breathing dirty air. If we fail to take action, the cost of extreme heat, and poor air quality from the climate crisis could add up to $167 million a year. We could lose another $155 million a year simply from days when it's too hot to work outside. The good news is that we're uh, not on track to face those worst-case scenarios thanks to progress that we've made, thanks to all of your work. 
Uh, but we're still facing some incredibly dire consequences, and we need to do so much more. Uh, that's why the tired refrain of, how do we pay for it? Aren't you t kind of tired of that? That they have done a very good job. I think that's been one of the ways they've been able to, uh, to kneecap what we need to do to take the, the wind from our sails or to take the legs out from under us. But people are understanding this much more these days, that we can't afford not to do this. I come from the Sunshine State where the electric utilities are the power, most powerful lobby in Tallahassee. And for years and years, they've said, we can't afford to change over to solar power. The Sunshine State generates about 1%, 2% of all uh, electricity from renewables. People get it now. They are tired. They know that if they could unleash the power of the sun, that's going to save them money. They also, they're also so powerful in Florida, they rolled back any goal relating to energy conservation. Electric utilities have no incentive, and, and the policymakers, the, largely the GOP in Tallahassee, has let them get away with this. They don't even have an incentive to encourage consumers to save on their electric bills. So a state that's in the crosshairs of the climate crisis, that, that quivers and quakes when another storm brews out in the ocean. You're not even incentivized to, to uh, save money on your electric bill. It's awful. We're going to address that. Uh, the climate crisis is, is about the future economy and uh, how, what we create together. So step one is stopping the Trump, the Trump administration from undoing so much of the progress that we've made together. Uh, Last week, Josh Nasser from UAW and Zoe Lippman, who's here uh, with the Blue Green Alliance, told us what's at stake with federal fuel economy standards. We can't gut these standards. Many of you in the room today were uh, there when they were negotiated. The automakers didn't want them gutted. The auto workers didn't want them gutted. Green groups don't want them gutted. Consumers don't want them gutted. Uh, they don't want, they, they're saving a lot of money in their pocketbook through those. And it's just a few voices in the oil industry uh, who are pushing for this, but they have the president's ear. Uh, people realize this is an era of global competition, and the climate crisis points us now to a joint solution, a shared solution. Clear standards that let American workers build cars here and sell them anywhere. And when people are spending less money filling up their tanks, they spend more money at local businesses. That means a little less profit for Exxon. I think they'll be okay. Uh, but 250,000 local jobs in our communities over the next 15 years if we keep these standards in place. Of course, the biggest opportunity here is in building the clean energy future and wind turbines and solar panels, that, that's great. But the big workhorse is in energy efficiency. And for working people, this provides enormous opportunities. Uh, Dave Foster, who helped found this organization, testified before our committee and told us there are 3.5 million jobs in clean energy. Most of them are in efficiency and construction. Uh, that's good because that's where union density is the highest. Uh, we need to keep focusing on that effort because it's where we're going to get a lot of the reductions in carbon pollution. Meanwhile, build those family-sustaining quality jobs. Efficiency is a big winner for this economy. Uh, so we have so much work to do to expand the clean energy economy and actually develop our Congressional Climate Action Plan so I'm going to close with a request. Uh, we need your ideas. Uh, about a week and a half ago, the select committee uh, posted a request for information. We want your detailed, scientifically-based policy proposals. And I have a couple of experts here from the committee who are ready to listen and take your ideas down. Anna Unruh-Cohen, of course, is our staff director. Allison Cassidy is our deputy staff director. Uh, they are fantastic. They're smart. They understand what it takes to move a piece of legislation through the Congress. 
Uh, but this request for information uh, is going to help us build that bold climate action plan. Uh, we would also encourage you to bring those proposals with coalitions of support at the same time so that when we roll these out, it's not just here's the, the lovely piece of paper, maybe it goes on the shelf, but we're ready for action. When we mean climate action, we mean action. Uh, so that's what it's going to take. We've got to keep building power together uh, because I know we can build the clean energy future and I know it can be one that advances dignity and honors work. Uh, we have to fight for it, though. We have to stand up to the special interests who hold us back, who, who want to hold us back. And Jason is right. They really do want to divide us, but we're not going to let that happen. We're going to work together in solidarity, solidarity to make sure we have climate action now. So thank you very much. Are you ready to get to work? OK, great. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Castor. Can I uh, have my first panel coming uh, to come right up here to the table, please? So as they take their seats, I'm going to introduce my, my colleagues, uh, starting immediately to my left. Uh, is Roxanne Brown, uh, International Vice President at Large uh, of the United Steelworkers. Immediately to her left is Colin O'Mara, uh, President and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. Immediately to his left is James Slevin, National President of the Utility Workers Union of America. And uh, uh, farthest left is Kathleen Rest, Executive Director of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you all for showing up this morning. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, ask a couple of questions. We're, we're a little late, so we're gonna kind of truncate this section a little bit so we have uh, an opportunity to let press ask questions as well. Uh, but let me ask a question of, of each of you and, and allow you to, to respond in turn. Um, how can we develop a plan to address climate change that creates new opportunities for working people while also creating good jobs and ensuring workers have what they need to transition in a new energy landscape. And I'm gonna ask uh, Roxy to take the first crack at answering that question. Sure, thank you, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Um, I really wanted to, to start out um, by just highlighting something that Jason mentioned in his remarks, which is that we're fighting for our future and the future. Um, we're all here, the eight uh, labor partners and six environmental partners of the Blue-Green Alliance are here together and are collectively unified around this solidarity uh, for climate action plan because we are fighting for a future. We're fighting for a future not just for our world and our climate. You know, Congresswoman Castor talked about what's happening and how late we are in acting we're fighting for a future for workers, a sustainable future for workers as well, particularly unions like ours in the manufacturing sector where you know, we've experienced a lot of devastation and job loss. We're fighting for a future for our families and our communities that have been impacted by both climate change and uh, the loss of jobs and wage stagnation and you know, lack of access to upward mobility. Everything that we have highlighted and identified in this Solidarity for Climate Action Plan helps us to fight. It's a toolbox, and the tools that we have outlined in this plan are essential to get us there. So Jason, you asked about, you know, what, what there includes a path for workers. A lot of what this plan talks about is technology. As a manufacturing union, you know, our traditional sectors will not succeed and will not have a place in the economy, in the growing economy, in the present economy, if technology is not advanced. The congressman also talked about uh, energy efficiency. Industrial energy efficiency is critical 
to bringing steel facilities, pulp and paper facilities, cement facilities, aluminum facilities, chemical facilities, refining facilities into the future. Carbon capture is critical to bringing industrial facilities into the future. But I have to tell you, it's 2019, and we've been talking about carbon capture for a very long time. I want that in the next five or 10 years, there are a suite of other technologies on the table that we can be not just talking about, but deploying across the manufacturing sector. That's the only way that manufacturing workers will play an active role in the growing clean energy economy. But also, and I'll close with this so you can pack, we can go to Colin, uh, the right to organize is essential. This economy is growing. We have a lot of you know, OEMs coming from overseas and setting up shop here in the United States, and they're you know, building you know, wind turbines and, and, and the like, but they are rejecting the rights of workers to organize. That's a problem. That's not a sustainable future for workers, and that is something that we reject. And uh, you know, that's why we highlight in this plan that it's essential to pass policies like the Protecting Workers' Rights to Organize Act, the PRO Act, which will help workers to be able to organize um, not just at current facilities, but industries that are growing in this country. So I'll pass it on to you. Colin. Great. No, thank you, Jack. Jason. Good to be with Roxy, as always. And thank you all for being here this morning. Um, one of the things you see in the plan is that it doesn't actually kind of lean left, lean right. I mean, it's kind of an all-American plan in some ways. And that one of the reasons for that is that there's a huge focus on infrastructure. And look, I mean, infrastructure works weeks become a joke, right? It's a hashtag. We talk about it every week, you know, and yet we still haven't seen, you know, kind of the potential for that. It is one of those unifying concepts, though, and unifying investment kind of proposals that could bring people together to do something big and bipartisan, regardless of what happens next fall. Now, obviously, it's easier um, in, in certain scenarios and certain, certain kind of balances of power. But at the end of the day, the infrastructure potential of this country, not to build back to the 1950s, but to build to 2050, has the potential to reduce as much as a quarter, even maybe even a third, of all greenhouse gas emissions. And what I'm talking about, this is not just roads and bridges. I mean, this is about building the transportation system of the future. This is about energy efficiency at scale in commercial and industrial facilities across the country. It's about having that, that, that grid that we've talked about, a smart grid that is fully integrated, much more deployable, much more efficient, much fewer land light losses. Um, it's actually deploying, it's deploying a range of technologies, both on-site and just uh, distributed as well as utility scale. Um, but there's also a big piece that's around natural resilience and making sure that we're rebuilding, you know, that we're restoring our forests, our wetlands, our natural complexes that serve twofold. On one hand, they provide great carbon sinks. They can pull a bunch of carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and at the same time, they can actually make our communities more resilient and make sure they can withstand the you know, healthier managed forest is more resilient to, to western fires in the west. The communities that have healthy wetlands are much more, much more resilient to the, the hurricanes and the inland floodings that we've been seeing. And so there's a suite of, of things that we need to do. But thinking through infrastructure, trying to make incremental improvements to the to reducing the amount of energy we're using, reducing the emissions, integrating clean energy into every step of that presents a huge opportunity to make a payment, make a down payment towards 100% goals and a net zero future in the in the coming decades. And so from the National Wildlife Federation's point of view, one of the things we want to do is make sure that infrastructure is a huge kind of leading element of any kind of package. You see it sprinkled throughout this entire document. But the investments that are possible, the jobs that can be created, the good paying jobs in every community, helping lift up communities that have been left behind. One of the stories that's been underreported so far is that most of the states that have the highest unemployment right now are some of the fossil fuel producing states. And so when you look right now at states like Alaska, states like West Virginia, states like Mississippi, states like New Mexico, I mean, as the, as the fossil, fossil fuel economy shifts, we need to make sure we're making investments in those communities. This, this, this disparity that's there, um, that's often overlooked by kind of one size fits all federal proposals, needs to be addressed. One of the best ways to address that is through massive investments in the ground. And look, folks will talk about the deficit, and Congresswoman Castor is one of my absolute favorites, said it perfectly in her remarks, the how we're going to pay for it line is, is just getting tired. We have a $22 trillion deficit. We have funded wars. We have funded nation building overseas. We have funded tax cuts. We have funded stimulus. We have funded bailouts. These are investments having massive return. None of the investments that were, I mean, very little of that $22 trillion was actually invested in this country in infrastructure. 
very little was invested in kind of growing the future in any kind of meaningful way for, in ways that work for working people and ways that work for our environment. And so we're going to make the argument pretty, pretty strongly, and you kind of see it again in this amazing plan, that we need to make these investments now. Because if we don't get folks working, if we don't start building the future, other countries are going to eat our lunch. Um, and I'm not, and I've said it before, I said it with Leo when I was in Pittsburgh a, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, you know, I'll be damned if on our watch we're buying you know, offshore wind turbines from Germany and electric vehicles from Japan and solar panels from China when we could make a lot of that here. Um, and we could actually lead the revolution. And to Roxy's point, um, the next generation technologies are in grasp. We absolutely need to be investing in carbon capture. We absolutely need to be investing in these next generation technologies um, to make sure we're cleaning up the industrial sector, making sure we're making our fossil sector as clean as possible as we're moving to 100% clean energy. Um, but it's going to require the will. And I swear, I mean, if we if we are under, if we're, if we're cheap now for penny wise and pound foolish and not make these investments, we will regret it for the next 50 years. So thanks very much for having me on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Jim? Thanks, uh, Jason. Uh, so, so, you know, the first step was is getting both the environmentals and the uh, labor unions in the same room on the common goal. We know that climate crisis is an issue, and we've seen this uh, in the utility industry um, from those who have uh, responded to the wildfires in California to the uh, super storm standy responders in New York, um, and the crisis is happening and needs change now. But that's not just on uh, those areas. It's going across the country. Um, when we're changing and making a transition to the cleaner energy, we need to make sure that we're all invested in it. Um, when we see what's going on in the communities that are uh, 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 threatened by coal and uh, they're shutting down of their plants, we're not only looking at the utility worker, but we're looking at the schools and the school boards and those uh, who live in that community. Many of our members sit on PTAs and, and we're hearing the voices that uh, teachers are now uh, being downsized and things like that. So we have to put a major uh, cost investment in it. But on the utility side, is we have to have an overall cost investment. And we can't, uh, like Colin said, uh, how it's gonna be paid for. You know, we gotta look at where it's coming from already. Um, when the CEOs of these co uh, utilities are making this tremendous amount of money, and we're worrying about how it's getting paid for. They've been making the money off of a lot of the fossil fuels for years, and it's about time they give back to the communities like we've been giving back and uh, making sure the investment sides. When we see gas mains that are leaking all over the place and uh, people can't even smoke outside their house because they're afraid of blowing up their homes, uh, we need investments in those gas mains. We need investments in the electric lines. Uh, I see my re uh, utility workers responding every weekend to uh, just a blow of a wind because the utility poles are now uh, over 100 years old and are threatened to be uh, torn down because just a simple windstorm. And, and we need a full investment in it. But that's not just saying, okay, let's get to work. But, you know, it needs to be made sure that we're invested in the worker and the community and making sure we're invested in the jobs. Uh, union paid scale jobs have always been good skill jobs and making sure they're done properly and making sure that they're, they're done on the ground where uh, apprenticeship programs. Um, and it's not just those pieces that are already there looking at the future. We're very happy now we've started uh, looking at wind turbines, but uh, the skill sets, not waiting for it to happen, getting in the process now and making sure battery storage, uh, the skill sets are made up. Uh, no worker should be left behind in this transition piece of it, and uh, they shouldn't be looked at and said, okay, those are the ones that worked in the coal plants, or those are the ones that worked in the uh, uh, gas industry. We need to make sure that we embrace them and educate them now so that when that transition goes on to a battery storage job or to a wind turbine, that they're prepared and ready to go at it. Um, and it, the skill sets is, is there. We need to put the investment in it and actually put the foot forward rather than just saying, okay, it's a great plan, 2050. I can make a lot of plans for 2050, but the reality is, is we need to do it today, and we need to make sure that we're putting our foot forward in making sure it. So this collaboration and this report actually kind of puts both parties together because we've been on both sides talking about these issues of climate change and both sitting on our agenda and their agenda and kind of put it where now we're collaborative looking forward. Our p a membership in the utility workers go to the parks, they go to the schools, they want to make sure that they have those things for the future. Reality is if we don't make those changes and we don't have it, a dead planet doesn't have good jobs. So we need to make sure that those jobs are prepared for and making sure the utility workers are in the forefront and making sure we manufacture it here. So that when somebody, uh, like Rock said, when we get wind turbines coming in here, that there are actually jobs that are created to here. That, that we make sure that the uh, steel and making sure that the equipment is, is manufactured here. We have some great skilled workers. They just need the opportunity at it, but the opportunity comes with investment. Uh, 
and we need to make sure that that investment is the forefront of it and making sure that we make sure the policies are that when you're going to put this energy, we're going to make sure that we can produce it here. So, Thank you. Jim. Thank you. Kathy. Well, good morning, everyone. I guess you can see that there's no debate here about climate change and about um, our commitment, our joint commitment to taking action on this issue. The time is short. The urgency is great. To avoid the worst consequences of climate change, we really need to significantly reduce our pollution, the pollution that causes it, and the science tells us that we need to be at net zero by 2050 and well on that path by 2030. And doing so can and should benefit working people and communities all across the country. There is, as you've heard, no dichotomy between a clean, healthy environment and good jobs. It's a false choice. It's a narrative that has been pushed by those that seek to divide us. We can do both, and we must do both. To tackle the climate crisis here, we need to prioritize research and investment in the technologies, the products, and the processes and materials of the future. And working people and communities need to be able to see and appreciate the gains from that innovation and from a cleaner economy. We need to make the jobs in a clean economy good paying middle class jobs. Now unions have always offered the best pathway for quality jobs and for good family sustaining livelihoods. That's why this platform is committed to high quality job creation across all sectors of the economy. But especially in those areas that relate to clean energy, adaptation, and resilience, and an emphasis on making those jobs good union jobs to ensure high quality. Unions have long been the drivers between, behind workplace health and safety protections that we count on and that we enjoy. As the former acting director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and once chair of the National Advisory Committee on Occupational Safety and Health. This is an issue that's really close to my heart. A safe workplace is fundamental to family sustaining livelihoods. Even today, there are too many workers that are still killed, sickened, injured, or made disabled from the work that they do on a daily basis. And finally, Addressing climate change needs to be done fairly. You've heard that from everyone here. We need to ensure fairness for workers, for low-income communities, and communities of color. These are the groups that often have faced disproportionate impacts from climate change and the other insults that happen in their communities. So fairness is vital. That's why it's so important that this platform calls for frontline and other communities and families and workers to have clean and affordable energy, water, and transportation choices in their community, along with equitable access to energy efficiency savings and programs that will help them finance renewable energy and energy efficiency efforts that they want to undertake. And that's why we at the Union of Concerned Scientists are committed to this platform and to solidarity for climate action and for economic justice. The science says that we must do it, we must act, and together we're all saying that, yep, we can. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks to all of you. I'm going to ask one more question on this panel before opening it up to reporters. Um, and I'll ask for a somewhat quick response, which, which I, I think this question will entail. So we talked a little bit about getting to consensus on this platform, um, by no means an easy thing. Um, what did you take away from this process? And what advice would you give to policymakers in particular trying to find common ground around sweeping issues like this? I will be quick. Um, I learned from this process how committed this alliance is to the work and each other. Because, you know, Jason, you mentioned it took eight months. I think 
there were 24 or 25 iterations of this, of this platform, but at no point did any of the partners say, this is too hard, let's stop. And that, I think, speaks volumes about um, how each of us understands that we're not going to get this done without a movement and a movement that includes all of us. And so that was, that was a really important lesson. Second, policymakers just need to listen to us. <laughs> I mean, Congresswoman Castor, you, you know, you talked about the resolution that was voted on. BGA has now offered a path forward. Take it and run with it. <laughs> Excellent, concise response. Uh, Colin. Uh, look, I, I think that uh, my biggest takeaway is that we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, you know, there are places where there's disagreement. There's disagreement on technology. Everyone's got their own, like, little, you know, kind of magic wand they want to wave. Um, but at the end of the day, like, the time for kind of purity has passed. Um, we are in a race against the clock right now, and this is a clock set by science, not set by politics. And so, you know, as nice as it is to basically say, I want all this technology, or I want all that solution, we need all of it. I mean, if we're actually going to get to net zero, and 2050 isn't early enough, we got to be there in probably the 2040s, if not earlier than that, especially if you want to deploy technologies around the world. Um, we need it all. And that means some folks swallowing, you know, some things that maybe in another time in a less urgent you know, kind of crisis period, um, they might not be as, as excited about. Um, it also did lift up, though, some pieces that just have massive support. And I just want to mention two in particular. Um, and Congressman Castor mentioned this at the beginning. Um, energy efficiency, it's not sexy. You know, Governor Bill Ritter from Colorado used to say, we need to eat your energy efficiency vegetables before you get to your clean energy dessert. Mm -hmm it doesn't get nearly the attention that it deserves. I mean, we can reduce emissions by 20 to 30 percent across the you know, various sectors by just focusing on efficiency in a big way. And that's efficiency kind of broadly defined. And the second is that there's massive support across the blue and the green for, for natural solutions, um, really trying to invest in our natural resources, trying to, and again, these are opportunities to have better paying jobs, have more organizing um, in some of these areas that haven't been organized in the past, um, but making communities much more resilient. And this is everything from having a biofuels policy that actually makes sense. Um, right now, you know, the ethanol war that's going on as folks are competing in Iowa is insane. Um, it's putting people out of work in other parts of the country. It's bad for wildlife. It's bad for water. Um, it doesn't help the climate crisis. And again, these are some tough issues that come in. But at the end of the day, we need all of it. And I think that what you're going to see more and more over the coming months and years is folks being willing to stand in solidarity, even though they might not agree with everything, they agree that the need is so great that we need that we're stronger together, and that if we don't hang together, we will surely hang alone. So, thank you. Uh, so, so the thing that probably my biggest takeaway on it was is, as much as we we have a common goal, we learned from each other on the whole process, and in the process was. Uh, almost in the understanding that uh, we thought we knew everything, but we found out as an alliance and, and, and solidarity in this uh, whole uh, 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 coming to the document was, uh, it was uh, kind of learning also, um, and, and kind of putting our differences aside because we thought we knew more than the other. And I think that was the biggest side of it and understanding. Because we both had that common goal. We want a clean environment. We knew, know that it's needed now, and it's enough talk and rhetoric, but getting together on the same platform to put this document forward and making sure that it's uh, it's unified um, was stronger. And and in the labor movement, we knew that always solidarity has always been stronger. When you uh, uh, get solidarity with environmentalists, it was actually even even more strong. And, and making the common goal because we both have that same common goal. It was a learning process and, and we did have disagreements at times on certain things, but we actually came to that common sense and said, hey, listen, this is what has to be done and this has to be done now. And in reality is we're not going to take this, the back seat on this ride. We're going to be at the front forefront of it. Um, and we're going to make sure that we let them know this is what we think and this is what the labor movement says and this is what the environmental movement says. And making sure that they hear us as one side solid voice and making sure that they understand uh, our common goal in it. Um, on the policy sides of it is, is that, uh, you know, uh, Congresswoman said it perfect, you know, we can't just come with the paper and put it on the shelf. Um, we got to come in force, and we have to actually say to them, enough talk, let's get boots to the ground, let's get this thing moving, let's get it moving now. People are hurting today. Um, membership is out there and, and parks are out there and, and everybody needs it now and it can't be keep saying, okay, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. It has to happen and it has to happen right now. We're in crisis mode. If, if, if reality doesn't set in, you're really on a different planet and, and you got to make sure that you understand it has to happen. And that will happen by pressure. 
and making sure that as a common front, we're making sure that it's our uh, forefront in making sure that climate change is making sure that it, it meets all of our goals and that it's good paying jobs and making sure that it's environmental safe jobs and making sure that we're in the forefront and we're not going to step just to put a piece of paper on a shelf. We'll make sure we'll keep pounding on the door. We've done it before and we'll do it again and making sure they hear us and hear us loud and clear. Because if it doesn't hear it, it's going to be bad. And that's the reality and it has to happen now. So, Kathy, you're about to clean up. Okay. So what I, what I took away from this um, process and this effort was um, the, the, the clear success of starting with a focus on what unites us rather than what divides us. We didn't gloss away from it, but the focus was on what unites us, uh, what we can do together. Um, there was a lot of honesty, uh, open debate, um, and discussion, and respect that happened around that table. And I think also a recognition that time is a precious resource. And we don't want to be part of continuing to let it waste away. Um, we were committed to working together on this with honesty, with respect. And I think what you see is a platform that shows that. Um, uh, we're going to open it up for questions from reporters. Um, Valerie, I see you here in the front, and Abby's. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering um, how compatible uh, some of the, I guess, the leading Democratic presidential candidates' climate plans are with the kind of platform that you've outlined. And I know you talked about purity tests, and now is not the time for purity tests. But there are a lot of. There's a lot of pressure for, for purity and especially on these candidates. So let me, let me take a first crack at that and, and then um, uh, open it up. Um, look, we, we are, I think, really excited by the level of ambition shown by uh, the Democratic presidential uh, candidate field on, on climate. I will say, I, you know, we're just as excited that there there is a growing and I think central recognition about the importance of making the jobs that are created and supported and sustained in that transformation high quality union jobs, mm -hmm. and 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 what it takes to to make that happen, protecting the right to organize, fundamental labor law reform, using policy mechanisms we know work to ensure that the, the work goes in a high road direction. Um, so that, that, that's, I, I think, most exciting to us. As, as the Blue-Green Alliance, of course, is a coalition, we, we do not endorse candidates, but we are uh, ready and willing uh, to educate any campaign about this platform uh, and talk about the proposals that we've got in it. Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, I mean, this plan was shared with all the, all the campaigns on both sides, Republican and Democrat, and I think there's, you know, 90% overlap if you compare the piece of this plan to any plan, and so the differences are really on the margin. Um, you know, again, I mean, I, I understand in a big field, folks want to differentiate themselves, and, you know, I've X trillions of this, and X, you know, my date's better than yours. Um, at the end of the day, we got to get the pieces right, right? And I think what you're seeing is convergence um, on the Democratic side of the major wedges all being, uh, being very, very consistent across. And I think one thing we haven't talked about, and I, I know it'll come up later, um, but, you know, kind of the commitment to workers, and particularly kind of workers that are being dis dis dislocated right now. Um, and, and again, I mean, we can talk about 2020 and the Senate races and the, and the presidential, um, but there's some things that can get done right now. Um, and I think one of the things we want to not lose sight of is that we got 15 months left of the 116th Congress. You got a transportation bill that's got a bunch of good climate elements that's kind of come across from the Senate. There's a whole bunch of stuff ready for, for mine workers um, that have to move pensions, black lung, reclaim, uh, Appalachian, um, the abandoned line, uh, kind of like man line program. I mean, there's a whole bunch of pieces that could move right now. And so, as much as I want to plan for the future, you know, tax extenders for, you know, offshore wind and renewable and, 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 and electric vehicles and for battery storage, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that that could move and we just want to make sure that we're seizing all those opportunities while we're pushing both candidates on, on both Republican side and the Democrats on the presidential to make tangible commitments that can actually pass um, that can actually move regardless of what happens in the uh, in the fall anyone else okay. any other questions from reporters Hi, I'm Andrew Wallander with Bloomberg Law. Um, so I'm, I'm curious now that this platform is uh, done and constructed, is there any focus uh, 
by you to grow the coalition? Or is there any interest from other labor unions or other groups um, to, to get involved in this coalition? Um, we are always open to having those conversations. Right now, we are focused on uh, making sure we are out there talking about uh, this platform with the partners that we have right now. Um, but um, if organizations want to talk with us about joining the Blue Green Alliance, we are more than willing to have that conversation. Great. And then I guess I have one other question. Can you talk a little bit more? You, you mentioned the eight-month process and um, how it was a, a dif dif difficult road to um, get this platform together. Um, what were some of the, the holdups and, and, and issues um, that came up during the discussion, and, and how did you get around that? I'll speak to this a little bit and others can, can pipe in. I mean, technology is always a tricky subject, right? Because it, it means different things for different partners and um, some of the needs for some partners may not, um, may not uh, represent the same need for another. I'll speak to our union in particular. I talked about carbon capture, utilization and storage. Uh, the Department of Energy under the Obama administration recognized that CCUS is critical to getting to our climate goals, and it's necessary not just for the power sector, but the industrial sector. So for us, that's a no-brainer. That needs to happen. Um, carbon capture technology is complicated uh, when you're talking to blues and greens, uh, because not everyone um, uh, believes that it's technology that should be used in the power sector. So that's always challenging. Likewise, um, on the energy side with nuclear energy, uh, Ernie Moniz also uh, believes that we can't achieve our climate goals without nuclear being a part of the picture. And there's always a question of what that means. You know, are we talking about making sure that we preserve existing nuclear or, um, or are we saying that, you know, we want to prevent any efforts for future expansion of nuclear and advanced nuclear? So um, those are the types of things that, that were pretty tricky. Um, God bless the BGA staff for their wordsmithing <laughs> um, and their ability to help uh, us kind of work through those challenges. But, but, but they were tricky and, and, and took some time. Is that um, I thought there was going to be a lot of a lot of disagreement around kind of goals and level of ambition, um, and there wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that's incredibly encouraging. I mean, this is a science-based set of goals, and then you know, kind of being more technology agnostic and kind of more inclusive of the solution the solution set, um, I think is actually a great path forward. And that came through the collaborative process. The only thing I'll add is that I think the, the mark of an ambitious platform um, like this is that at some point in the process, everybody at some point was made uncomfortable, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and if, you know, if, if that doesn't happen, it probably means you're not being ambitious enough. And, and God knows we've seen enough lowest common denominator products uh, coming out of coalitions. Uh, this, this is not that. And I'd also add, if you're not uncomfortable, it also means that you're not growing. And I would say that over the course of this process of developing this platform, this alliance has really grown tighter. And going into uh, next year, you know, um, the reporter asked about the presidentials. Again, you know, we've offered a pragmatic path forward that pulls people together, that unites people, that people outside of the, the alliance will, uh, will, will, you know, there are things that will resonate with them. So, you know, we, we urge policymakers to really, really take a look at this and walk with us, help us to get, to get the elements of, of this plan actually, um, you know, uh, made into action as we go forward into next year. Mm -hmm. And on that uh, good note, we're going to switch to our second panel. So let me ask Mark and our panelists to come on up, and we'll we'll trade.
Well, that was a, a great first panel, and hopefully we'll be able to, to follow up on that. Um, the second panel is about uh, addressing inequality and pursuing climate solutions that build a better future for all Americans. So I think some of the central questions that we raised in coming up with this platform is, how can we ensure that jobs created in a clean economy are quality jobs? How can we address income inequality in ways that address racial and environmental injustices? This panel is going to bring together labor and environmental leaders to discuss how the Solidarity for Climate Action platform addresses these issues in a comprehensive plan to address climate change and address income inequality simultaneously. So I'm really pleased we have some wonderful panelists with us here. We have uh, Louisa Blue, who is the Executive Vice President for the Service of Employees International Union. James Boland, President of the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. And Debbie Cease, who's the Senior Lobbying and Advocacy Director at the Sierra Club. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, <clears throat> so let me ask, where did that one go? Let me ask the first question here. Um, why is it important to your organization, uh, and how will Solidarity for Climate Action's platform meaningfully address climate change in ways that address the dual crisis of climate change and in income inequality? Louisa, do you want to start? Hi. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out uh, to listen to the panelists and also to learn more about our platform from the Blue-Green Alliance. So the Service Employees International Union, we represent two million working men and women. We're a very diverse union. Women, people of color, immigrants, low income, uh, doctors, nurses, you name it, we represent them. Uh, we are the largest healthcare union. I used to be a registered nurse. I worked at San Francisco General. So for me, science is on our side and that we have to listen to science and really work at how we can move forward to make our planet a healthier place. So our members and families are being hit hard by both the ravages of climate disasters and toxic pollution in our communities. We've lost lives. We've lost and damaged homes. We have respiratory illnesses that are just some of what our members are experiencing. And many of us live in those communities hardest hit and have the least resources to respond. We've had fires in California. I'm from California. Our home care workers have been impacted the most in those for forest fires. Our public sector workers who are the first responders are out there trying to do the best that they can with limited resources. We have health care workers who have to take care of little babies, little toddlers, who suffer from the effects of air pollution because of asthma. We are there because we have to take care of patients and deal with their um, emotional distress when they're hit by a hurricane and they've lost everything. And there's no other place to turn to except the unions. Uh, in the southern coast, when Katrina first hit, and I was working in the south then, and I saw the devastation in New Orleans, and I saw our members being displaced because they lived in that ninth uh, ward and suffered the consequences of the water coming over that wall that was supposed to protect them. And then school workers who we represent um, and stand side by side with the uh, AFT where they lost their jobs because the schools were ruined. Many of our members are on the front line of these, con of these crises resulting from climate change. This platform demands we revitalize and expand our public sector workforce to ensure that we have the staffing needed to accomplish the goals put forward in clean energy infrastructure, resilience and adaptation, as well as the staffing needed to respond to extreme weather and other impacts of climate change. SEIU members know that we must make bold, immediate action on climate change, including holding corporations accountable for the rampant pollution and ensuring good union jobs as we transition to a clean energy economy. That's why we're, we're so proud to support both the Green New Deal, which is our North Star for what needs to happen and needs to be accomplished, and also the Blue-Green Alliance's platform, a roadmap of how we can get there. We stand up, 
with our fellow union members and our allies in the environmental community to ensure a better future for all. SEIU stands in solidarity with our friends in the labor and environmental movements that are calling for tackling this challenge in a way that creates good paying union jobs for workers around this country. We need to expand and grow unions in every part of our economy to make sure that the jobs we create with the investments used to tackle the climate crisis are good paying union jobs. It's clear to us that we have to take bold action we have to take immediate action to address the environmental challenges. We are working with the Sunrise Movement. They marched with us in Detroit during the debate, and we, we joined forces because we understand what's needed for our communities. And it is communities of color that get impacted the most by the disasters that they face, but also because of the lack of jobs. So we hope that everybody um, really reads this platform and help us help our elected leaders who are trying to push for a better planet and to um, address the climate um, pollution and the environmental impact. Let's take a look at this platform. It is a path forward and it's the key to be able to move our community forward and to have a better life, not only for our communities, but also to have a healthier planet to live on. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. That was, that was great, James. Um, I hope I didn't lose track of the question. You know, uh, Jason gave uh, wonderful of opening remarks this morning, and I said, well, there goes my speech. Well, whoever uh, gave me some uh, talking points must have stolen all yours, Jason, and uh, I uh, endorse everything you said. Uh, I'm Jim Boland. I'm a bricklayer, uh, so anything I say comes across as a bricklayer. Never had a science class in my life. My brother has a science degree. Both his children are uh, young scientists, but uh, I just get what I pick up along the way. But I'm, I'm a fellow traveler for a reason, because the first day I landed in New York City in 1970, the first thing I noticed that it was very different from home was that I couldn't see the sky, nor could I see the tops of the buildings as I walked around. So that had a dramatic impact, and around the dinner tables there would be lots of environmental arguments way back then. And you know, if you took a strong stand for the environment, you're almost a communist, you know, in, in certain circles. So uh, I'm a fellow traveler because uh, uh, I realize that climate change is real. And it's important to me, and it's important to my grandchildren and to the members of the union I represent. Now, bricklayers, what would they know about uh, a rapidly changing tech world? So you look out, you see evidence of our work everywhere not just in this country, but across the built environment across the world, brick ma masons, stone masons, tile setters, and the people that restore those buildings, and we're in industrial plants like the steel workers as well. Uh, currently, two years ago, there wasn't one robot on a construction site in America. There, I think there are 200 now and growing. Uh, 200 in block and a whole bunch in brick. Five years ago, our members and contractors didn't know anything about building information modeling. They know an awful lot about it now, and there are a lot of iPads rather than paper drawings on job sites. So we're adapting to the changes in our union. We train in about 87 places across the country and probably 20 more job core centers. So uh, we work very hard on keeping our membership uh, up to the minute, so to speak. And um, going forward, you know, what I envisage is labor and environmentalists working together. I look on the environmentalists as the idealists in the group, but I look on us as being uh, able to give you f f boots on the ground, so to speak. And uh, I think there will be a huge role for government in all of this, both federal, state, municipal, I think we come in uh, with our connections to the community and to business, because businessmen are going to put so much of this together, that's how they make their fortunes. Uh, they didn't complain about too much money when during the Industrial Revolution or the mechanization of the world. They didn't complain when they moved from 
uh, steam to diesel or from horse and buggies to motor cars. And uh, this is just political posturing. Uh, it's trying to get us every last dollar out of fossil fuels before we have to move on and do the things we do to create a better world. Um, I think building trades unions are ideally situated to grab on to some of this change and work with people, environmentalists, uh, with business people, with whom we have collective bargaining agreements with all the time, and with government at every level, probably in a more coordinated way than we did. I was going to, I was listening to Louisa, members of my union, what they've done, their work is beautiful to see. It's uh, an aesthetic treat, but this is the same union that has so many people that suffer from asbestosis and silicosis, and we've had to fight uh, hard political fights to upgrade those standards. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you that I come from a family where my working grandfathers, railroad workers back in Ireland, had defined benefits that transferred to their wives to, uh, when they died. My father, the same way, was retired for 30 years. I have them, and uh, my children that are in unions have them too. Those that aren't, not so much. I think it's very important for unions to strongly represent the workers in what's going to be a rapidly changing world, otherwise, we'll have a situation like the current one, where 50% of our population can't come up with $400. I think it's very important for unions, and the onus is on us more than anybody else, to connect to those communities that are less fortunate and help raise them up and make them part of our membership. You know, I got to be uh, a successful bricklayer because there was a Irish leadership in unions and contractors that were built, had a bridge that I could cross to help me along. We as responsible union leaders need to build bridges to the immigrant community and to the poorer communities in our country to lift them up along with ourselves. There's more money out there sitting on the sidelines than ever there's been in the history of humanity. Just read the Harvard Business Review. They're pretty honest about this. We need a mechanism that distrib distributes and shares the wealth better as we move into this new economy. And I think, uh, yeah, Jason, I think you said 2050 is the, our deadline to get a lot of this done. That seems like two generations for me. But it's a mountain of work, and we need to be very much involved in it, and it'll be rapidly changing as we do it. But, uh, and, uh, you know, it's not going to be a static world. It's going to be a very dynamic one. But I'm looking forward to the challenge, and, you know, I like to think that my grandchildren will have a better life and better benefits than my grandparents did. And that's what brings me to the table. Okay, thanks so much. Debbie? <laughs> Thank you. Um, as um, I think it was Yogi Berra said, this feels a lot like uh, de deja vu all over again. I don't recall exactly how long it ago it was that I first sat side by side with allies in labor, faced a room, and said, you don't have to choose between the environment and jobs. That's as true today as it was then, but that truth has evolved. Because not only do you not have to choose between the environment and jobs, but as we face the dual crisis of climate change and runaway income inequality, we actually must address solutions that address them both. And those solutions and those problems are intertwined. And it's even more complicated than that because it's not just jobs and environment. It is communities. It is racial and environmental justice. So as we face the challenge of climate change, the impacts will be felt unequally. The impacts will be devastating everywhere, but frontline communities, people who are least able to respond to the changes in the world will be most impacted. So as we pursue solutions to climate change, the biggest challenge of our life, of our, our generation and future generations, we need to find solutions that meet all three of those. And that's one of the reasons that the Sierra Club is so pleased to be able to be a part of this solidarity for climate action because it does embrace the dual challenges and the interrelated solutions. And so 
Um, today we're here as a founding member of the Blue Green Alliance to lend our voice and our support for this vision and for heading down the road of actually pulling together those interrelated solutions so that we face the challenge of climate change, we create good quality union jobs, and we address the problems of frontline communities as they face both the changing economy and the changing world from climate change. Thanks, Debbie. Each one of you have mentioned frontline communities in, in your response and, and disadvantaged workers. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how vital you think it is that the platform put these communities and their workers at the forefront of the debate in tackling climate change. And maybe um, you could share just some thoughts of some uh, ways that we can really lift up those communities in, in the solutions that we're putting forward. Uh, so let me start. Um, for SEIU, because many of our members are the frontline responders when disasters hit, uh, when the first hurricane hit um, Puerto Rico, you know, a couple of years ago, devastated that country. FEMA was very slow to respond. And I was on a conference call with the uh, um, elected leaders of our SEIU locals there. And then I find out that there are 21 super funds, funded sites in Puerto Rico. They were all compromised. And being the nurse, I said, okay, I don't know what are in those super fund sites, but whatever's in there is probably really bad. They've been compromised. So that means the soil has been polluted, the water has been polluted, and we will see health effects for decades to come in terms of the impact on uh, residents of Puerto Rico. There was dead silence on the phone because it was one more issue that we had to confront and had no confidence that this current administration was even going to address the long-term impact of those super funds being uh, compromised. And then <clears throat> with all of the fires that have happened in California, I live in California, and having to do disaster relief, um, our home care members who lived up in the forest uh, rural areas, they take care of the frail elderly and special needs community. And they had nothing after their, their homes were destroyed and trying to take care of the clients, give them the best that we can. And we had to not only get money into those communities, but basic needs like diapers, trying to figure out how do we get diapers up there? Who's gonna make the ride? What kind of uh, work can we do to collect those everyday items that they need to take care of their patients. Um, the fire that happened in Paradise. I have a brother-in-law and his wife that live there. They lost their homes, but they were lucky. But other community folks in Paradise were not that lucky. And so for our SEIU members, uh, we have to figure out how do we get up there again. It was hard to get up there because of the devastation. There were you know, roads that were cut off, but we have to figure out how we could get up there and help not only our members, but the clients that they take care of. Um, people of color are impacted the most. We are going to start a project in Los Angeles um, where there are zip codes that have been identified and there's lead poisoning in the soil because there was an Exide battery plant in those neighborhoods. They were supposed to clean up before homes were built, schools and play art, uh, playgrounds were built. And those are all communities of color, predominantly women and predominantly immigrants. Uh, so we're working with our SEIU public sector local who, um, work for the county health department, and then also our local, uh, mainly our home care local, who are impacted, their members are impacted by the lead poisoning there. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're doing um, and really taking a look at the communities of color and then joining forces with um, uh, organizations that have been doing organizing in those areas and joining forces with them to get the word out and also to hold 
uh, the politicians accountable, and also the corporation that have polluted our areas. Thanks, Lisa. Um, James? Yes. I'm not looking to jolt anybody early in the day, but when I, I mentioned the 1970s as me starting out in construction, and the truth is the crews I worked on and around back then were probably 25, 30% African American. And uh, not just the family crew that I was with, but all the competition as well. So there was quite a presence. And then, uh, you know, we have an opioid epidemic now that affects all of us. There was an epidemic in the 80s that uh, wasn't dealt with as holistically as we're dealing with the current epidemic. And there was a criminalization of the black community, and I think they lost their links to the construction jobs. And the immigrants from uh, Latin America came in and started to uh, become players in the construction industry. Now, not to bore you, but uh, about 16, 70% of the population of the country is African American, and we're lucky if 5% of the construction workers are. 40% of the construction workers in this country, I would say, are Latino, some immigrants, some not, and maybe 20% of our union. Uh, they've come into positions out west and uh, in Nevada and California, but affecting the change in other parts, parts of the country takes quite a bit of work. I think we lose an awful lot of our apprentices. We probably only graduate somewhere between 35 and 40 percent. But we're trying to build pipelines to Job Corps. I see my friend Brian, who used to run it there, and uh, to the schools and communities to recruit more people that uh, would see construction, which is very hard work, as a path forward. And that's where our, uh, where the rubber meets the road and us reaching out to immigrant communities and uh, communities of color and taking them in and uh, having uh, a membership in our unions that's reflective of their num numbers in society, so to speak. So I hope I've answered the question a little bit. Yeah, I think, I think that's helpful. <clears throat> um, just very quickly to add to that, I think that um, the reason that it is so important that we consciously, uh, at every step of the way, incorporate principles of social and economic and environmental justice into our climate solutions is history and human nature. Um, the impact, the changes that will be driven by both a changing climate and changes we make to address that um, will create massive opportunities for getting it right, for putting together things that work for all communities, all people. It also presents immense opportunities for a race to the bottom, for those who are in power and can benefit, the people who uh, got rich off big oil. Once everybody recognizes that climate change is real and it's got to be dealt with, those same players are going to be trying to figure out how do we get rich in this? How do we keep power? And so as we work to create public sentiment and momentum for making climate change, we need to at the same time, at every step of the way, make sure that there is an awareness and a commitment to doing it right. And that's why I really love this platform. Wonderful. Um, brought up some examples in some states that you guys have been um, you know, from impacts of climate change affecting workers and, um, you know, often states are the, the front lines of new policy ideas to, to address the problems that they're seeing. Uh, I was wondering if any of you have uh, some examples you might be able to share of states that are making progress on addressing both of these crises together. Um, you know, are there lessons to be learned that we could then translate into action across the country? Um, in California, because we have uh, we have a governor um, that believes in uh, a healthy planet, and then we have a, a state legislature, both in the assembly and in the Senate, uh, that are very progressive, and they are committed to um, you know legislation 
that will address climate change, but also 100% uh, renewable, um, working towards that. Uh, Washington State uh, tried to pass similar legislation that we had in California, and then uh, Oregon as well. And I know that in Minnesota, because uh, I was there a few weeks ago meeting with the environmental justice allies there, and they also want to learn how we were able to get that legislation passed uh, in California. So we'll continue to work um, with our allies in the states where we have SEIU locals that really want to address um, fossil fuel uh, emissions, work closely with the fossil fuel uh, unions uh, to make sure that we are united in whatever the legislation is. Um, but mainly, it's just really listening to each other um, and learning from each other uh, and keeping that listening open so that we can continue to have this dialogue and then build support for the Blue Green Alliance's platforms and that we can help our elected officials who are ready to take some bold action uh, to help them out in terms of developing uh, legislation to that effect. But most importantly, they have to listen to the workers that are impacted, whether it's they're being impacted by the climate and the disasters, or whether or not they're being impacted because of loss of jobs. And we have to make sure that we do listen to them and that they are at the table uh, to develop that legislation and to implement that. They have to have a voice in this. I think you inadvertently stacked the panel with Californians. <laughs> I'm a member of uh, oh, San Francisco local and uh, lived out there for a long time. And I guess my, and I've lived here and in the Northeast and Midwest as well. But uh, I, maybe it's the good weather and the nice climate, but there seems to be a higher awareness of uh, climate issues in California, especially now with the fires, than there is any place else that I've been. Uh, luckily, though, both the Assembly and the Senate in California, most of their members of Congress and the governor are both labor and environmentally friendly. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when I think of Republicans and climate, or Republicans and rewarding workers, they, they sound like Luddites uh, all the time. They're modern day Luddites. And uh, I think. Uh, we're getting some interesting legislation. They recently passed, they're working on misclassification of worker bills. Uh, and this business of the uh, gig economy has been taken on big time out in California. And, you know, that's a way for uh, uh, crooked employers to exploit workers and not uh, give them real jobs with benefits and any kind of security and stability. And uh, some of our friends in the legislature are sponsoring these bills and they're getting through and there's public education going on in the process. Uh, I think that's very important. And uh, you know, I heard Governor Brown before he retired come in here, he sounded like he came from a different country. His uh, vision of how to move the state forward and I think uh, Governor Newsom is following in his footsteps. So I would, since it's the fifth biggest economy in the world, I would look there for leadership more than any place else politically, maybe or socially in this country with all due regards to those of us in Washington, you know? So without focusing in on a single state, I would just say um, if we look back to the states, that is where progress on climate and on transitioning to clean energy has started. Um, so the uh, initial shift to more fuel um, uh, fuel efficient cars started with states passing legislation to call for that, which eventually created the dynamic to get uh, Obama's fuel economy standards passed. Uh, the first places to look to putting some kind of cap on carbon were states. Um, today, we see across the country states starting to commit, states and cities committing to 100% clean energy. So I think the, the, the genesis of a lot of our climate and clean energy action will start at the states. It's ultimately going to need to be picked up by the feds as well. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? Okay. 
Um, so I'll do one more question to, to wrap this up, and then we'll turn over some questions from the audience. Um, but wanted to give everyone an opportunity to talk a little bit about something that your organization is working on in this space, either on climate change or on addressing racial and, and, and economic inequality that folks in the audience might not know about, but something that you might be really excited about and, and give a chance to, to share that. Ooh. Um, yeah, we'll start at the other. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I will start by saying that uh, the Sierra Club, inspired by the Blue Green Alliance and uh, inspired by the Justice Forum, took a look and said, "Well, what is our vision long term? Where do we want to see the world in ten years?" And so, we have been developing a Sierra Club platform for change in the next decade, which is very consistent with this platform, but drills down a little deeper on some of the, the policy issues that we love to get, get our heads wrapped around. But uh, when you look at it and you compare it to something that we might have put out 10 or 20 years ago, it is also, just as this platform is, fully embracing the connectedness of our justice and environmental and clean energy agenda. So it's something that I've been really excited to work on. We're going to roll it out probably in October. Wonderful. Sounds exciting. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, silicosis and asbestos earlier. And uh, our union spent about 40 years working on a silica standard. And, um, you know, I think the exposure was 40 per thousand. Uh, from the 1970 regulation until the one we got a couple of years ago, and that has it down to five or six, but it uh, means monitoring the air that we work in, both indoor and outdoor. And, uh, w you know, it was qu quite an achievement and a victory for the union, and it resonates well with our members because when we survey them, they put dust into the mix all the time. and. Uh, uh, that was our way of uh, rewarding them, so to speak, by being able to work with uh, uh, OSHA during the Obama administration. And even the current administration did enact it into law. The White House worked with us and said, what do you want here, believe it or not, and, uh, and uh, helped it to go through. Uh, on, uh, I think the misclassification is huge, too, because if you're not in the construction industry, you may not know that uh, uh, union employers are tied to us through collective bargaining. Everything they do is legal, fair, on the money, and they pay their people what the contract says and pay their fringes on time and all of that stuff. Their competitors are not so bound. They can take and exploit those immigrant communities, hire them all, misclassify them as contractors, which provides unfair competition from the get-go. If you want an example of the uh, the unscrupulous contractor being rewarded and the good one paying a penalty in a competitive place. Construction is a good place to work and our employers are very conscious of this and very much on our side on some of the issues that we might like to talk about in this room because we talk to each other all the time. Um, so I did mention one project that SCIU is doing in Los Angeles. But there are other projects that um, we're working on as well. And one of the ones that we really want to focus in on is joining up with the youth in this country, in particular the Sunrise Movement, um, because that's our future. And so being able to uh, connect with them and then also inviting them into forums that we have so that our members can hear directly uh, from the youth movement who have been very active on the climate justice work. Because um, there's just a lot of misinformation that's out there, and so you know, it's our responsibility, we feel, uh, to get the right information out there, but also to see the potential that we can have as labor if we do join forces with, um, especially the youth. They are going out on strike on the 20th. And 1199 New York, yesterday, they, um, they took children out on strike as well. Toddlers took them out of preschool um, and marched around as part of the lead up to the uh, September 20th strike. So we're gonna continue to work on that. Um, and we just think it's really exciting that if there's a way that we can 
inspire the youth of this country to step out, no matter what age they are, to take a stand on how important it is that the climate um, is a matter of life and death for us. And because we represent healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, scientists, et cetera, um, we want to add our voices as healthcare workers in this country to that work and to help. I'm going to keep saying it again, to help uh, our elected officials who are with us develop that legislation, and we are going to push for the right of workers to organize into a union, and we are going to continue to push and hold corporations accountable. So I just want to share this one stat because, you know, we've been um, doing the fight for 15 now for almost seven years. So just in terms of corporate greed, so the CEO of McDonald's, on average, he makes $10,000 an hour. The average pay for McDonald's workers is $7.91. Just take that into effect, right? Um, so the disparity is there, and corporate America is going crazy in terms of suppressing workers um, and it's time that we have to call them out and I don't even want to talk about Exxon right or Chevron um, I represent workers I used to represent workers in Kern County where Delano is you know the grape strike and all that uh, so the first time I went to Bakersfield there were oil pumps all over the place people's backyards, in front of a restaurant. And you know, I just started asking questions. Oh, does that family get revenue because that oil drill is there? No, they get nothing. They just have this oil drill drilling in their backyard. There is something wrong with that. But I'm also sympathetic that um, the oil industry in Kern County are also union jobs. And in Bakersfield, Many of my members who work for the county, they have relatives that work in the oil industry. So it's, you know, how do you find that balance, right? At the same time, recognizing that a lot of those jobs are union, but also what's our role to push for cleaner jobs and making sure that those jobs remain union and that they keep the same good wages and benefits that they've ha had uh, working for the oil industry. All right, thank you so much. Uh, why don't we open it up to some questions from reporters who are here? All right, well, thank you all. This has been a, a wonderful panel, and it's great to have all of your perspectives on these issues. Um, and now I'm going to turn it back over to Jason, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Uh, and as they are moving off uh, of the stage, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Brad Markell from the AFL-CIO to come to the podium, who is going to uh, introduce our special guest and keynote speaker. Thanks, Jason. Uh, as Jason said, Brad Markell, I work in a president's office at the AFL-CIO, and energy and climate is one of the things I'm tasked with working on. Um, so the labor movement is dedicated to the proposition that working people deserve a voice on the job and in the halls of government. But too often, the concerns of working families have been shunted aside. It's put us in the spot we're in. Inequality's been rising for decades. Bad trade deals replicated over and over. And now we face this challenge of what's the green economy going to be like for us? Is it going to support family supporting jobs? Are we going to create good community benefits around clean energy deals? The answer is not clear to that. Um, fortunately for us, there are elected officials who think the answer is yes and resoundingly yes. Uh, and no one's more clear about that than the senator from Oregon, Jeff Merkley. Um, he's a friend. He's a great champion of labor. He's the son of a millwright. Uh, for those uh, who are uninitiated, a millwright is the person when something big breaks, like say a crane or a sawmill, they show up and get it fixed. It's heavy, sometimes dangerous work, and uh, that's Senator Merkley's background. Um, 
He served as the Speaker of the Oregon House. He's been in the Senate since 2009. It's a continuation of his lifelong ambition to make Oregon and the world a, a better place. In the 10 years that he's been in the Senate, Senator Merkley is relentlessly focused on making life better for working people, uh, making our country work for ordinary folks, and that's what keeps him fighting. Uh, that's what got him involved in public service in the first place, and he's working at it uh, to this day. This past July, uh, with support from the AFL-CIO and the Blue-Green Alliance, Senator Merkley introduced the Good Jobs for 21st Century Act. Uh, this bold legislation incentivizes and promotes the creation of good family wage jobs in the clean energy sector. It gives tax credits to companies that meet strong pro-worker standards, such as high-quality employment, living wages, apprenticeship opportunities, benefits. Uh, as my boss, Richard Trumpkus, the president of, of the AFL-CIO said, standing next to Senator Merkley uh, in the Capitol, this is the right bill at the right time to fight climate change and create the kind of family-sustaining jobs our country is desperate for. Senator Merkley is one of this nation's foremost champions for working families and for the climate. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Uh, Brad, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Thank you for the partnership. We have two great challenges. The fight to create good paying jobs for American workers and the fight to save our beautiful blue-green planet. And this solidarity for climate action says those two things go well together. I think about the first question, that is this issue of the, the challenge of our atmosphere and I think about it in these terms. If you breathe in a deep lung full of air, and I invite you to consider doing so while I'm talking, breathe it in, hold it for a few seconds, exhale, and realize that that air that was just in your lungs, dramatically different from the air when I was born. It has 33% more carbon in it. This is a dramatic transformation in a single human lifetime. And it already has extensive effects on the ground. In my home state of Oregon, it means that the snowpack in the Cascades melts earlier, which is not good for irrigation, and it's bad for our trout and salmon streams. It means that the pine beetles are living through the winter, great for pine beetles, terrible for pine trees. It means that over on the coast, we now have to artificially buffer the Pacific Ocean water because it's too acidic because the carbon in the air becomes carbonic acid in the ocean. And it means, most dramatically, a longer, fiercer wildfire season doing great damage to our forests and the smoke doing great damage to our economy. So real facts, real changes, just all of those in my, in my home state. And we're seeing similar effects across the planet in all kinds of different ways, including fiercer storms like we've seen with the hurricanes in the southeast pounding, uh, well, one place after another, and most recently, the Bahamas. Meanwhile, we also have a big crisis for working jobs in this country. I'm a blue-collar kid, as described. My dad was a mechanic, a a millwright that kept the mill running and then working as a union machinist in many other heavy equipment jobs. And when he and my mother bought their house, the cost of a three-bedroom, simple ranch house post-World War II was essentially twice the amount of a, of a machinist's annual wages. I still live in that same community. And now a house is five to six times annual wages of a machinist which means home ownership is getting out of reach and healthcare is getting more expensive and the track for education is getting more difficult. At the foundation for a family, there are four things that come up in my neighborhood. You, you hold a conversation, within 30 seconds, people are gonna talk about healthcare, housing, education, and a good paying job. So we have to fight to create far more of those. Four decades of my life in public service, we have seen the condition for 
middle class America, flat or declining. We had NAFTA and CAFTA, and I remember a, a speech that was described as NAFTA, CAFTA, SHAFTA. Hard times for working people, allowing companies that play by very different rules in terms of wages and environmental standards to have full access to our market and undermine good paying jobs here in the United States of America. But now we have an opportunity because we know that we have to drive a fast transition to renewables to stop the steady accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere and all of its consequences. But we also know that there are a lot of good paying jobs in the fossil fuel world, a lot of good paying jobs. And often a bird in the hand is much more persuasive than a bird in the bush. So how do we make sure that we have a vision for good paying jobs, for union jobs in the renewable energy economy? And that is what the Good Jobs for the 21st Century Act is all about. 10% tax credits to go to projects that embody those good paying jobs. And by that I mean living wages and strong benefits, project labor agreements, apprenticeship opportunities, first priority for jobs from those who have lost their jobs in the fossil fuel economy. Companies have to be neutral on union organizing. So these set of things create a vision for rebuilding the energy economy, but doing it with jobs that are a foundation for America's families to prosper. And this can be in wind and solar and geothermal and wave and in-pipe projects and in-stream projects and wave power projects and nuclear projects. The bill also lays out energy efficient commercial, bin, uh, commercial building uh, tax deductions, reauthorization, and a 10% tax credit there. In addition, it provides codification of the Clean Energy Manufacturing Initiative. It creates the Clean Energy Manufacturing Hub. It creates manufacturing grants, all designed towards this goal of good paying jobs in the thriving challenge of rebuilding our energy economy. So we have here an opportunity, if we can seize it, to do right by the planet and right by working America. Now my dad's union job made all the difference to the foundation for our family. It meant that I could afford to buy a house, could afford to go camping on family vacations. My parents could save a little bit and say to their kids, we're not sure what you're going to want to do, but if it involves college, we're saving some money to help you out. A foundation for a family to thrive. We need that foundation for every family in America, and we have been losing ground. Let us take this opportunity to gain ground, do right by the planet, and to make America work for working Americans. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank Senator Merkley. I want to thank Representative Castor. I want to thank uh, all of our partners and speakers uh, from our different organizations. I want to thank all of you. Uh, I, I will just say in closing, um, we came here this morning to talk about a plan. It was also observed by a number of our panelists that plans only go so far. <laughs> what we need now is action. So uh, let that be our mantra as we leave today. Let's turn plans into law. Uh, into legislative proposals that address our climate crisis and our economic crisis at the same time. Thanks, everyone.